This morning we come to, again, this power-packed little book of the Bible named James. If you're new to us this morning, we want you to know that we're glad that you're here. We study the Bible verse by verse because these words are the words of life. God's Word is the Word that will revive your soul. Psalm 119 says, Revive me, O Lord. Revive me according to your Word. Are you feeling blue spiritually? Are you feeling distant from God? Run to His Word. His Word will revive you. Spend time in His Word. So that's what we do each week, and that's what I hope that you do each day. We have just been singing, All Glory Be to Christ, and, and I love many of our hymns. I just have to say this. Many of our hymns end with the hope of heaven. I hope that you will begin to notice that. The last verse that Ben and the team just left us, just led us in, leads us to the great hope of heaven, and it really leads us to that, that beautiful picture that finally, when everything is said and done at the end of Revelation, it, it describes that He will wipe away every tear, and there will be no more crying, there will be no more death, there will be no more sorrow, and listen to this, and He will be our light. The Bible says that there's no sun in heaven. There's no S-U-N in heaven. There's no need for an S-U-N because it says the S-O-N lights heaven. God is light, and in him there is no darkness. And so, friends, we look forward to that. Just this morning, Larry Auten, the guy who usually sits right here on this second row with his wife, um, Deirdre, Larry... Um, and Deirdre flew out quickly yesterday to get up to North Carolina, and his blessed sister, who loves the Lord, went home to be with the Lord at 6.30 this morning, and suddenly was sick this week, and went septic, and her organs shut down, and she died. Now, that's difficult because she had been the caretaker for both Larry's mom and a sickly sister, so now their family's having to deal with that. But listen to this. What he said to me was, we don't, we don't see this, we don't understand this exactly, this is very painful, but Sister Susie is sister, he said, Susie is in heaven with her Savior, and that makes this okay. And so, the hope of heaven, friends, that is where we come to. James wants us to have the hope of heaven, and not a wishful hope, but listen, a sure hope. You see, much of our culture thinks of God in wishful terms, uncertain terms. But God's Word has been given to us so that we can be sure. You don't have to wonder. That's why His truth is so clear. And that's why it's not just a short little book. It's, it's quite a letter of love. And so this morning as we come to James once again, we see that this pastor in the first century is writing to churches that are spread all across the Roman world and off to the east outside the Roman world. He's writing to Jewish Christians and he's wanting to help them be sure that they are in the true faith of Jesus Christ. Listen to this, not just as a community, but as individuals. And if you will notice with this, whereas many letters in the New Testament are written for the whole body to hear the Word, the whole church that it was written to to hear the Word, this is one that is written to the church, but it's written to, very specifically, the individuals in the church. And we know that because he says, some might say, well, I have faith. And he says, but if you say, I have faith, but as we've been looking at for the last few weeks, but no works, your faith is dead. I want to review and just kind of notice the title of the sermon this morning. What is justification? This plays, you're going to see it. It's already through the text that we've been studying. You're going to see the word justify. It's an important word. Justification has to do with our salvation. And that's what James is, is very excited about this morning. I have asked Ben to come preach to us. And so I'm going to step down in just a minute, and Ben is going to step up. Let me set it up, and then Ben is going to come. And I hope you have your outline and you're ready. We're going to look at this issue of our salvation because that's what James is very, very intent on, and that's what he wants us to see. 
Um, if you have your outline, look, look there with me. If you have your Bible, you can go ahead and turn with me um, to James in chapter 2, and we'll be looking at these verses beginning in 14. Um, it's also on the outline, I believe, that's there. But look at James chapter 2 and verse 14. I want you to notice the words justify here as we go. Verse 14, what good is it, my brothers, if someone says he has faith but does not have works? Can that faith save him? If a brother or sister is poorly clothed and lacking in daily food, and one of you says to them, go in peace, be warmed and filled, without giving them the things needed for the body, what good is that? So also faith by itself, if it does not have works, is what? Is dead. Verse 18. But someone will say, you have faith, and I have works. Show me your faith apart from your works, and I will show you my faith by my works. You believe that God is one, you do well. Even the demons believe and shudder. Verse 20. Do you want to be shown, you foolish person, that faith apart from works is useless? Now he gives some examples. Verse 21. Was not Abraham our father? What is that word? justified? Mm. Was not Abraham our father justified by works when he offered up his son Isaac on the altar? You see that faith was active along with his works, and faith was completed by his works, and the scripture was fulfilled that says Abraham believed God, and it was counted to him as righteousness, and he was called a friend of God. Verse 24, you see that a person is justified by works and not by faith alone. Hmm. And in the same way, was not Rahab the prostitute justified by works when she received the messengers and sent them out by another way? So, two Old Testament examples here. Verse 26, for as the body apart from the spirit is dead, so also faith apart from works, is dead. Now, you have your outline. I want to just review very quickly. Look with me. We've said very carefully over the last few weeks, number one, that saving, excuse me, that there is two kinds of faith. There is saving faith, and there is non-saving faith. There is saving faith, and there is non-saving faith. You have room for it. Put out there to the side of non-saving faith, dead faith. This is faith that cannot save you. It cannot bring eternal life. It will not take you to heaven. Two kinds of faith. All through the New Testament, we see it. All through the words of Jesus, we see it. All through the words of Paul, we see it. All through the words of James, we see it. Look at number two. This faith without works equals dead faith or non-saving faith. Faith without works is dead faith. Now, James is making a very important point. He brings it up. Somebody comes to you and says, I'm hungry or I'm cold, and you just say, go, be in peace, be warmed, and you don't seek to help them. That means that you're you're not showing the way of God. Don't call yourself one who has living, saving faith because you don't, if you can do that. Number three, remember, there were two major distortions of the gospel that was going on in the New Testament day. There were two major distortions of the gospel. One of the distortion of the gospel was it's all works and no grace. That was, in fact, the mindset of the people when Jesus showed up and began preaching. They said, you have to do this. You have to keep the law. The Pharisees and the Sadducees have it together. They're showing you what you're supposed to have, what you're supposed to do, and yet you could not, you would not be able to live up to that standard, and there there was just no grace in that. Jesus came so that we could see the grace of God, that when we don't deserve salvation, when we don't deserve a Savior, one is sent He's sent, and we try to kill him. Herod goes after him and tries to kill him. 33 years later, we succeed. This God in the flesh, we reject. But he rises from the dead. He comes back to life to show that he is indeed the Messiah and that all who will believe in him and trust in him can be made right with God. And then 
enjoy the life that he offers. Now, so these, these two extremes, do you see these two extremes on your outline? All works, no grace. All grace, no works. There, there's both of these. After the gospel flourishes, listen, after a, few, a couple of decades of the gospel growing, there are some people that are starting to say, yeah, man, we've received the message of Jesus. You just believe in Jesus and it, you know, it's all taken care of. You don't have, you, you're just, you're in him. It doesn't matter what you do. It doesn't matter the way you live. It's a distortion of what it really means to come to Christ. And so there was this all grace, no works mentality that is not of God. God is saying, you have been saved, as you're going to see what Pastor Ben says, you have been saved for some purposes, and those purposes involve good works. You have been saved for this purpose. And so true saving faith results in a faith that can be seen. Now, I've been thinking about this, and I've been thinking about this phrase um, that, that comes next, and I want you to see this. Number four is this one. You remember this one from last week? James and Paul are fighting these two extremes. They're fighting the all grace or the no grace extreme. Paul is fighting it with, with one group in the in New Testament world, and James is fighting it with another group in the New Testament world of opposite extremes. Do you remember what we said last week? We said it's like these guys are not fighting face-to-face -face over the gospel, but they're fighting back-to-back -back over the gospel. Now, I want you to see a couple of pictures here that help with this. I was just, I was just thinking about this, trying to figure this out, and notice the first one here. Here's these guys. I don't know if any of you know where this comes from. I didn't know where all of these come from. But anyways, I didn't know where this came from exactly, but I found it. And who is this? Oh, wow. So some of you have seen this. Three musketeers. And there's actually four of them in this picture. And, they, and what are they doing? The, the enemies are coming at them, and they are fighting back to back. They're depending on the guy behind them, right, to protect them and to fight the battle. And so here comes closing in these enemies of them, and they are fighting. And that's, that's kind of where we see Paul. Now, look at this next one. I didn't, I didn't know where this came from. I just searched around, and I found this. Some of you guys are laughing because you know where this came from. Some game or something like that on the Internet, set in colonial period, uh, I believe, something along those lines. But these, these two guys backing back-to-back -back fighting. Look, look at the next one here, and we won't dwell on this one very long. Some of you, I'm sorry, I couldn't... <laughs> Couldn't help but think of that one as well. Climactic scene, the end of Mr. and Mrs. Smith. But, but check this out. I, I asked a friend who's an artist to actually draw this, and I, I actually sent him these pictures. And look at what he sent back. A friend of ours, a friend of Sheridan Hills, drew this last night or two nights ago. And he did it entirely on a computer. And he said, I love this concept. I explained to him what we're studying. Matt Davidson, he's an artist for Disney and has been for 25 or 30 years at this point. But, but Matt, he, I said to him, Matt, this is such a cool concept to help us understand the book of James. And so Matt said, I, I can illustrate that. And so here we imagine James to be one of these guys attacking falsehood from one side and Paul, the other one, attacking falsehood from the other side and saying, it's not like there's this nice blend of grace and works. It, that is not true, and that's what we're going to study this morning. What we're going to see is that these two great warriors, proclaimers of the gospel, are saying the same thing in a different way. Notice this and fill it in on your last one, number five. Faith alone saves... But faith that saves is never alone. True faith that saves is never alone. So the big issue is our justification. What James is getting at is, are we really saved? And uh, Pastor Ben is going to come now and help us to see this issue of justification. What is it and how is it that Paul and James are doing this? Pastor Ben, come and teach. It happened to me in Europe. 
I was standing with a group of friends and I said, let's play some football. And they brought out a soccer ball. And I said, no, I want to play American football. But if you're in Europe and you say football, they understand soccer. But in America, there's two different sports, football and soccer. So if you're in Europe, you have to learn, don't say football to mean soccer. Say, don't mean football to say American football. Say football to mean soccer. And don't use soccer because nobody knows what that means. So I had to learn how to play soccer, and it was grueling. They don't understand why we use the word football to refer to something that you use your arms and your hands and your upper body to win. That's the point. They should be called upper body ball or handball or arm ball or something, but it should not be called football because it's confusing the rest of the world. Football is the greatest sport in America but it's the greatest sport in the world. But we're not talking about the same football. So why do we know to use the right terms in different places? We know because we've assimilated their meaning to that context. And I'm going to argue that James and Paul are doing the exact same thing. They are fighting back to back but we have to understand what they're saying. So, many people have wondered over this seeming contradiction over the past several hundred years, and the seeming contradiction appears in Romans 3, verse 28, and James 2, verse 24. Listen to those verses. Let me read them to you so you can see the seeming contradiction. This is Paul writing, We hold that one is justified by faith apart from works of the law. By faith apart from works of the law. That's why somebody is justified. They have faith apart from works of the law. But now James writes in James 2, 24, you see that a person is justified by works and not by faith alone. Do you see the contradiction? It's a seeming contradiction, and at first glance, it looks like they're saying two completely opposite things. So you can do one of two things. You can conclude first, the Bible contradicts itself, let's pack up, let's go. But because you have 10 points on your outline, that's obviously not what I concluded. And the second thing that you can do is find why these two brothers are saying Two different things seem to be saying two different things and try to unite it with the rest of Scripture. Try to see how they're saying the same exact thing in the other places of Scripture. So, from the onset, I want to emphasize with Pastor Andrew that they are not at opposites. They are saying the exact same thing and they're just focusing on different aspects. Let's get to the bottom of this problem. In the context, they seem to be saying different things. And what makes matters worse is that James uses the justification of faith by works for Abraham to refer to his salvation or to prove his salvation. So James sees Abraham justified in Genesis 22 over here. But Paul sees Abraham justified in Genesis 15 over here. So Paul is saying Abraham is saved in Genesis 15. There's no question about it. James is saying Abraham is saved not until Genesis 22. So how are they using the word justify? How are they using the word justify? That's the word we have to look at to get clarity. And I hope that it will clarify it for you. The way that you can use the word justify is first to mean to restore to a state of reconciliation with God those who stand under judgment under the law by His law. So, 
Justify means to restore to a state of reconciliation. And I'm going to argue that's how Paul is using the word. But justify can also mean to demonstrate or verify or vindicate or validate. So you say the right thing and somebody looks at you and says, you're just in saying that. You're justified in saying that. That's how James is using the word. So here's the clarity. Paul is saying Abraham was declared, was stated by God, was restored to this state of reconciliation in Genesis 15. And he demonstrates that. He verifies that in Genesis 20, which is what James says. That's how we clarify this contradiction. That's how we clarify it. But this is one word I want to say about our understanding of the Bible. When we come to the Word of God and we point out all these contradictions and all these things that appear to be different, to be in contrast, we have to step back and do the work that it takes to see how are they alike? How are they similar? How are they united? So, what do you do when you come to the Bible and you see a contradiction? Well, here's what I did. I listed all the places where Paul used the word justified. And I looked at all the places in James's letter where he talks about justification. And I mashed them together. And that's where I came up with 10 points. That's where I came up with 10 points. I looked at God's word. I said, what is Paul saying about justification? What is James saying about justification? How are they similar? And how are they emphasizing two different things? And I got 10 points. Actually, I got like 20 points. But then I had 12 points. And now I have 10 points. So I wanted to simplify it and clarify it as much as I can. And I want this morning to be like looking through a camera lens for us. As we look through a camera lens, we have to focus. And the way we do it is we twist knobs and we get a clear picture. The fuzziness goes away. And I think when we look at the doctrine of justification by faith alone, it's meant to encourage us. It's meant to challenge us. It's meant to rebuke us. It's meant to satisfy us. And it's meant to bring us somewhere. So we're going to look at that right now. The reason why you have four pages is because I have the scriptures printed and we're going to read through scripture because these are not my ideas. These are not the reformers ideas. In fact, these are not even Paul's ideas. These are God's ideas. And so what we want to do is we want to uphold the tradition of publicly reading God's word together as the body of Christ and seeing what does it say and how does it apply for us. So let's go ahead and start with number one. Let's go ahead and start with the definition of what justification by faith is. Justification by faith alone is a one-time act of God whereby he declares us righteous through Christ's sin-bearing death on the cross, imputing his righteousness onto us and imputing our sinfulness onto Christ. This is called the great exchange, where Christ takes the place of sinners on the cross. He is condemned and we are vindicated. All who put their faith in him have the assurance that they will stand as righteous before God at the day of judgment. You cannot earn your salvation any more than you can count all the sand on a seashore. This is what the Reformation was all about. It was concerned on this vitally important work of Christ's death on the cross and He taking our place. 2 Corinthians 5.21 For our sake, God made Christ to be sin who knew no sin so that in Him we might become the righteousness of God. Romans 5, 8-10 God shows His love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Since therefore we have now been justified by His blood, much more shall we be saved by Him from the wrath of God. For if while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of His Son, much more now that we are reconciled, shall we be saved by His life. Number two, justification by faith alone upholds the law. It supports it with one hand. 
justification by faith alone, the fact that sinners are saved by grace, that they are saved apart from their works, that truth upholds the law. In the church, we are battling those two extremes. One side asks, if you tell people that they are saved when they are sinners, aren't you giving them a free pass to continue sinning? The other side asks, if you tell people that the only way they can be saved is by being righteous, aren't you teaching them that they have to earn their salvation? Those are two sides. Saved by grace, continue in sin. Saved by works, be holy. And the answer to both questions is no, because justification by faith alone doesn't teach you're saved by grace, so continue in sin. And it doesn't teach that you have to be righteous and earn that status in order to get to heaven. It teaches neither of those. What does it teach? Romans 3, 28, verse 31. Paul argues, he concludes, we hold that one is justified by faith apart from the works of law. Do we then overthrow the law by faith? By no means. On the contrary, we uphold the law. How is the law upheld? How can you maintain that sinners are saved by grace, that they can do nothing to earn their salvation, that it's all through Christ, and yet they have to be holy? Romans 5, verse 20. Now the law came in to increase the trespass, but where sin increased, grace abounded all the more. Why? So that as sin reigned in death, grace also might reign through righteousness. Grace might reign through righteousness. You are saved by grace for righteousness. Grace might reign through righteousness leading to eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. What shall we say then? Are we to continue in sin that grace may abound? By no means. How can we who have died to sin, how can we who have died to sin still live in it? It makes no sense. You've been saved by grace so that righteousness will reign in you. Look at verse 3 of chapter 6. Do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? His sin-bearing death on the cross? Verse 4, we were buried therefore with him by baptism into death in order that just as Christ who was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in newness of life. Do you see the connection between grace empowering us to follow the law of God because the same power that rose Jesus from the that raised Jesus from the dead is at work in you so we're a bunch of dead people and then Christ blows his life-giving breath into us and what does he say continue in sin he says Walk in righteousness with the breath that I've given you. Because you are dead, and now you're alive. So, grace, justification by faith alone, upholds the law. The law is upheld when we believe in Jesus Christ and depend on Him for eternal life. Moses gave us a law that could only bring us death. It could only show us our need for a Savior. And then Jesus comes and He says, come to Me all ye who are weary and heavy laden and I will give you rest. Take My yoke upon you and learn from Me. For I am gentle and lowly in heart and you will find rest for your souls. For My yoke is easy and My burden is light. Why is it easy to follow the law through grace? Because when I am weak, Christ is strong. Because when I am dead, Christ is alive. When I don't feel like doing it, the Holy Spirit 
prompts me and gives me life to do it, to work. So Christ's law is easy, not because it is permissive. It's actually harder than following Moses' law. But it is easy because He carries us. He gives us this light burden. We work, but He holds us up. What does James say about this law? Following the law. James 1, verse 25. The one who looks into the perfect law, the law of liberty, the law of Christ is called the law of liberty. Because by following it, we are free. By following it, we are less burdened. Because when we follow it, we follow it through Christ. That's why he calls it the law of liberty. The one who looks into the perfect law, the law of liberty, and perseveres, being no hearer who forgets but a doer who acts, he will be blessed in his doing. Look at verse 12 of chapter 2. Speak and so act as those who are to be judged under the law of liberty. For judgment is without mercy to him who has shown no mercy, but mercy triumphs over judgment. Justification by faith alone upholds the law, but number three, justification by faith alone is the basis for Christian relationship. And really, these are four images of how justification by faith alone plays out. The first way it plays out is in the relationship between a husband and wife. And you can look at Ephesians 5. I'm going to summarize it by saying the following. The basis of marriage is the reality of Christ's relationship with the church. Christ's wife is the church. That is her identity. And as such, her identity causes her to operate by being sanctified, by being splendid, by being pure, by being holy, by being without blemish. So too husbands and wives live out their relationship rooted in their identity as husband and wife. When you take vows at a wedding, you are tying those vows to your identity as a husband and wife. So that when your marriage is on the rocks, you look at your identity and you say, Honey, we made these vows to each other. They are rooted in who we are as husband and wife. That is who we are. We became husband and wife on this day. It was a one-time act. We were declared husband and wife. Let's continue in that identity. Let's continue living out those vows. The expectation we place on married couples in this church is in line with the biblical commands and the vows and commitments they make on the one-time act that we declare them husband and wife. Do you see the problem, though? If two people are not married but want the benefits and the commitment of something that they do not have in terms of identity, how can they have those commitments? They cannot. How do you tell two people who are living with each other that are not committed to each other based on an identity but based on pleasure, that that is a rock-solid foundation. You can't do it. Because pleasure is not a rock-solid foundation. How I feel about you on the day of our marriage is not going to sustain our marriage. What I promise to do based on Scripture and God's power is going to sustain us. So I look at marriage and I see the image of what Christ does to us when He declares us righteous. He changes our identity. And He says, you are just. You are perfect. You are righteous. So be perfect. And be righteous. That's who you are. Husbands, wives, act like that. Be rooted in that. And live out those implications. But you also see this relationship between parents and children. You see this between husband and wife. You also see it between parents and children. This identity, this identity factor. This factor that calls us to live in light of who we are. When my son Noah was born, he did not earn the right to become my son. He simply was my son. He didn't do anything to earn that status. That was his identity. It is his identity. 
And with that, he receives the status of heir. He receives that status. It's given to him. It's pronounced. This is your offspring. This is your heir. He will inherit everything you possess. And I was telling Esther this, and she said, you're half of it. <laughs> but Noah is our heir. When he comes of age, he will own everything we have. Not based on his earning it. He's already a son. We want him to respect people. We expect obedience. We want him to love people. We want him to be honest, truthful. We want him to live a good life. We want him to have a college education. We want him to have a, a great wife. And we want him to grow up and eventually buy a home. And we want him to retire. But imagine if he did that and the only thing that he did once a year was send Esther and I a Christmas card. That's horrible. Did he do what we expected him? Yes. But there was no relationship. Do you think he will be on our will? No. He might be my son, but he didn't act in conform with his identity. He didn't have a relationship with us. Obviously, we hope that our relationship with him will grow. And yet, he knows that he will always be welcome because of this. Because he's our son. That we will love him even if he regrets being born to Esther and I. We will love him sacrificially. But does that mean he will be on our will? Did he act like an heir? No. This is clearly portrayed in Romans chapter 8, verse 12 to 17, when God is talking about us as his heirs. Listen to what he says. Paul says in verse 12, Brothers, sisters, we are debtors not to the flesh to live according to the flesh. For if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of your body, you will live. For all who are led by the Spirit of God are sons of God. All who are led by the Spirit are sons of God. For you did not receive the spirit of slavery to fall back into fear, but you have received the spirit of adoption as sons by whom we cry, Abba, Father. The Spirit Himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. Not that we must become children of God, but that we are. That is who we are. We are rooted in that identity. And if children then heirs, heirs of God and fellow heirs with Christ, provided that we act like heirs, provided that we suffer with Him in order that we may also be glorified with Him. Do you see the identity factor? It's who you are. So be who you are and become who you are. You're a son and a daughter of Christ. Suffer with Christ. Live a life of obedience to Christ. Paul is saying it clearly. Your identity is connected to what you do. If you prove to not be spirit-filled, then you're not a legitimate son. You're not a child of God. You might think you're being an heir, but if you want to go to heaven so that you can experience anything other than God, you are not an heir. It's those who love God and long to see Him that are heirs of Christ because they have the Spirit of God. What else would we do in heaven if the S-U-N is not lighting the place and the S-O-N is lighting the place? I want to see glory. That's why I'm going to heaven because I want to see the sun radiate His light onto my face. Why do you want to go to heaven? Do you want to go to heaven because the streets are paved with gold? Because seeing your long lost relatives will be more precious than seeing the risen lamb? There's nothing wrong with wanting to go to heaven to be reconciled and to be with our brothers and sisters who have passed. 
But if that's our only reason, Paul is saying that we are not heirs of Christ. We are heirs of Christ when the Spirit of God in us says, Father, I want to see you. Father, I long for you. So, husband and wife, parents and children, church member and church member. We see the doctrine, this identity factor of justification by faith alone in how we act with other church members. Christ's expectation for each of us, brothers and sisters, is in Galatians chapter 6, verse 2, where Paul writes, bear one another's burdens and so fulfill the law of Christ. If we're saved by grace through faith, we fulfill the law of Christ by caring for one another, by living in community with each other, by visiting each other outside of our Sunday gathering, and caring for one another in love. If you are rooted in and established in Christ, this is His expectation for us all. James 2 says it this way, If a brother or sister is poorly clothed and lacking in daily food, and one of you says to them, Go in peace, be warmed and filled, without giving them the things needed for the body, what good is that? This is no good, obviously. The expectation Christ has for us all is to fulfill the law of Christ, to love our neighbor as ourselves, and to care for our brothers and sisters that have ongoing needs. And finally, this grace saved salvation, this grace based salvation, is seen in how we treat outsiders, how Christians relate to outsiders. What should Christians do? when they relate to outsiders. By outsiders, I mean people who are not Christians, people who don't even come to church. How do you treat people who are not Christians in light of your status as a justified saint? As one who has been declared righteous and who has been saved from condemnation. You have, you possess the treasure of the gospel. The most loving thing we can do for our brothers and sisters in this church is to care for them. And the most important thing we can do for people outside of the church is to give them the treasure that we have. I was sharing the gospel with a uh, friend named uh, Hussein. I'm not sure if I'm saying that right. He's actually Bali from Africa. Mali, excuse me. He's from Mali. And he's from Africa. And we were talking about the gospel and I asked Faseni, I said, do you believe that you will go to heaven? And he said, "Uh, Lord willing, and Allah teaches that if I am pure enough, I will make it to heaven. Now, he was a a nominal Christian, a nominal Muslim, but he, what he said was shocking to me. He said he had a Christian friend, and I asked him, has your Christian friend ever tried to convert you? And he said, no, why would he do that? And I said, because Christianity at at its core teaches that people need to come under the authority of Christ, that they need to submit themselves and believe that Jesus Christ is the only way of salvation. And Fuseni told me, no, my, my Christian friend told me that I just had to continue reading the Quran, continue to offer prayers of purity, and he believes the same thing, that he reads his Bible and that he prays. And I said, Fusini, I'm sorry to tell you, brother, friend, that's not Christianity. Christianity doesn't teach that the way you get to heaven is by reading your Bible and praying more. That if you've read enough chapters in the Bible, or if you've read the Bible enough times that you'll get to heaven, that God will suddenly think you're pure. And he said, this is new information. Then what is Christianity about? I said, Christianity is about doing nothing. Christianity is about looking to Jesus. Yes, but we believe in the same Jesus. I said, no, you believe in a prophet named Jesus, 2 Corinthians in our book says there are many Jesuses out there. The one we believe in is God. He is Yahweh. For all intents and purposes, Jesus is God, Allah. 
And he said, well, then we have two different religions. The conversation went very peacefully. Um, I mean, it was not in, as intense as I'm making it sound, but it was riveting because I heard that his Christian friend withheld this fundamental belief that we must believe in Jesus Christ for our salvation. There's nothing we do to earn that. What is the most loving thing we can do for our non-Christian friends, people outside this church? Colossians 4, 5, 6. Paul writes, Walk in wisdom toward outsiders, making the best use of time. Let your speech always be gracious, seasoned with salt, so that you may know how you ought to answer each person. Share the gospel, brothers and sisters. Be bold to declare justification by faith alone and holiness, without which nobody will see God. James 2.8 says, If you really fulfill the royal law according to the Scripture, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. You do well. Loving our neighbor as ourself means that we have to tell them that they are sinful. And we do that in the most loving way because we know where God has rescued us from, right, brothers and sisters? We know that God has rescued us from sin, has put on us the status of Jesus Christ. And how great that status is. And it helps us live in light of His expectations. Number four, justification by faith alone is the foundation for all Christian obedience. Justification by faith alone is the foundation for all Christian obedience. Justification by faith alone saves by a faith alone, but that faith that justifies is never alone. So justification is by faith alone, but that faith that justifies is never alone. And what we mean by that is faith that justifies always includes evidence of works. It always includes evidence of works. Romans 1, verse 5. Think about how Paul starts this massive letter. If you know anything about the book of Romans, you know that there's a lot of jam-packed theology. And Paul even calls it the dynamite of God. How does he start this letter that is centered on this doctrine of justification by faith alone? There's nothing you can do to earn your salvation. How does he start? Romans 1, verse 5. In Christ we have received grace and apostleship to bring about the obedience of faith for the sake of His name among the nations. The purpose for me writing this letter is so that you will obey what I tell you in this letter. I expect obedience is what Paul is saying. How does he end the letter? How does he end this massive letter? Romans 16. Look at Romans 16. Verse 25, now to him who is able to strengthen you according to my gospel and the preaching of Jesus Christ, according to the revelation of the mystery that has kept secret for long ages, verse 26, this mystery, this secret has been now disclosed through the prophetic writings and has now been made known to all nations according to the command of the eternal God. Why was it revealed? Why was justification by faith alone revealed? To bring about the obedience of faith. Paul says it clearly in the letter to the Romans. He says the purpose of your salvation is to live in obedience to God. Paul says this in Ephesians 2 verse 8, For by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not your own doing. It is the gift of God, not as a result of works, so that no one may boast. Verse 10, for we are His workmanship, created in Christ Jesus. For what purpose? For good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. Isn't that crystal clear? Isn't that getting a little clearer? How the gospel of grace, this grace-based salvation, is rooted. And when it is rooted, we live in obedience. James says it this way in verse 17 of chapter 2. So also by faith, by faith by itself, if it does not have works, is dead. There's some other passages of Scripture there. I encourage you to go home and read those to see that Paul emphasizes works just as much as he does grace. That there is a relationship between the two. 
we must remember that God never expects us to do something that he does not empower us to do. Which is why number five, faith that justifies includes works that are enabled by God. Faith that justifies includes works that are enabled by God. The power that enables me to live a holy life, to act in obedience to God and to put to death sin, is the power that comes from the Holy Spirit. The power is blood-bought through Jesus Christ and ensures that I will live a holy life in accordance with genuine faith. We are empowered by the Holy Spirit to do the works that James is talking about. Listen to Philippians chapter 2, verse 12 to 13. You have to wrap your mind around this glorious text. Philippians chapter 2, verse 12 to 13. My beloved, as you have always obeyed, so now, not only as in my presence, but much more in my absence. Work, work out your salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God who works in you. Work hard because God is working in you. Wrap your mind around that. He's saying, the work I do as a Christian, my holiness, my repenting of sin, my loving my wife, my doing these minuscule things around the house, by loving my neighbor, by not being lazy, by doing all of these things, do them because God is doing them in you. Work because God is at work in you. Your doing is God's doing in you. Galatians 2.20, I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me and the life I now live, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave Himself for me. The reason why you should work, the reason why Christians should be the hardest workers when it comes to holiness in the world is because God is enabling you to do it. The reason why you should wake up in the morning and study Scripture is because God is doing it in you. If that is not the basis for why you work, then God is not in you. But these texts show us, brothers and sisters, they encourage us that God never lets us do something without enabling us to do it. That we are to obey and that obedience is easy because God is in us doing it. There's, a, there's actually a funny uh, anecdote where Spurgeon is asked by David Livingston, Spurgeon the great preacher, who worked himself to death, who was one of the hardest working Christians in the last 200 years to further the purposes of God, was asked by David Livingston, another man who worked himself to death as a missionary. David Livingston asked Spurgeon, he says, how, how do you do it? How do you do it all? How do you manage a school, manage 60 non-for-profit organizations, pastor a church, preach 10 times a week? How do you do it? What strength do you have? And Spurgeon <laughs> responded to him, he said, you're forgetting there are two of us. You're forgetting that God is at work in me. There's no excuse for us Christians not to be holy. We have the Spirit of God, the power of God in us that raised Jesus from the dead is at work in us to bring about obedience. We have no excuse to lack in holiness. We have every excuse to say, I want to be holy. Number six, faith that justifies grows in maturity. Dead faith remains stagnant. Watching a Christian grow can be a lot like watching a garden grow. At first, there doesn't appear to be any growth. You wait the first couple minutes, the first couple weeks, the first couple of months, 
And then finally, you notice, after a lot of time, that the garden produces the choicest fruits. So too, the Christian, the Christian who is rooted and established in Christ has drunk up the nutrients of His sweet word, has been kissed by the beams of sunlight radiating from Christ through prayer, that Christian will grow and reap a harvest. That Christian will grow and radiate Christ. Because faith that justifies grows in maturity. Dead faith remains stagnant. There are two passages there, Ephesians 4 and James 1, that I encourage you to read at home. They encourage us to grow in our faith, to continue in pressing hard, to not remain stagnant because dead faith is stagnant. Number seven, faith that justifies struggles against sin. Faith that justifies struggles against sin. Dead faith enjoys sin. There is a big difference between a Christian who struggles with sin and a Christian who says he struggles with sin. Just like there's a big difference between a fish and a whale, and an even bigger difference between a boy and a girl. Black and white. Animal and plant. Huge difference between a Christian who says, I struggle with sin, I'm tormented, I'm grieved, I'm repentant, and one who says that he struggles and uses the language of struggle to mask the pleasure of sin. Brothers and sisters, you know what it's like to struggle against sin. You know what it's like to be tormented in your heart over bitterness and anger. Romans 8 describes this torment, this clash between the Spirit and our flesh. And if you read Romans 8, you'll see that the Spirit of God and our flesh are at war with each other. So, when somebody says, I struggle with sin... There's war. There's torment. There's agony. There's bloodshed. There's pain. There's sorrow. You don't see that in dead faith. Because dead faith enjoys sin. James 1, verse 13 to 15 says it this way. Let no one say when he is tempted, I am being tempted by God. Don't blame God. For God cannot be tempted with evil. And he himself tempts no one. But each person is tempted when he is lured and enticed by his own desire. Then when that desire conceives, it gives birth to sin. And sin, when it is fully grown, brings forth death. So faith that is real struggles. Faith that justifies struggles against sin. Does not use the language of struggle as a mask for my pleasure of sin. Number eight. Faith that justifies perseveres through great trial. And oh, how it perseveres through great trial when you are on the deepest, most hard, most dark valley of your life. And you see on the horizon, you see Christ. Is it not worth it to persevere, to reach Him? Is it not worth it to push through sorrow with prayer? Is it not worth it to push through sin with repentance? Is it not worth it to agonize with the struggles of life, with cultural issues, with political issues? Isn't it worth it to struggle with those by banking all of your hope in Christ? Isn't it worth it the perseverance that real faith has? Brothers and sisters, you know it's worth it. Why is it worth it? Because in Romans 5, Paul writes, Since we have been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. No trial, no circumstance can take that away from me. I have peace. Verse 2, through Him we also have obtained access by faith into His grace in which we now stand. And we rejoice in hope of the glory of God. Not only that, but we rejoice in our sufferings, knowing that suffering produces endurance. And endurance produces character, and character produces hope. And the hope, that hope, does not put us to shame. Shame. Because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. 
So you see Christ at the end of that tunnel. It's a dark tunnel. You'll have to go through it. And you get there, and God showers you with love and grace. That's what's waiting for you at the end of that dark valley, brother and sister. Friend, if you don't know that peace, you can have that peace this morning that all of the strife and anxiety and all of the hum-hum of life can be yours if you look to Christ in faith and say, give me peace. Give me faith. Help me believe. Help me to cling to You. James says it this way, count it all joy, my brothers, when you meet trials of various kind, knowing that the testing of your faith produces steadfastness and steadfastness has, let steadfastness have its full effect that you may be perfect and complete, lacking nothing. And we lack nothing when Christ showers us with His love. There is no lack. There is only, want, there is only plenty. No want. Number nine, faith that justified finds Christ absolutely irresistible. Dead faith enjoys making much of Christ. I only want to look at one passage and then we will close with number 10. But faith that justifies justifies, finds Christ absolutely irresistible. Listen to how Paul says it in Philippians 3 verse 8. I count everything. I count everything. Everything, everything as loss. My house, my cars, my dogs, my cats, my children, my family, my IRA account, I count everything as loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. For His sake I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish in order that I might gain Christ and be found in Him. When's the last time you thought of everything you owned, of everything that you are, of every status you have, when was the last time you did that and said meditatively in your heart, that's all loss for the sake of knowing Christ the surpassing worth of Christ. I'll give my life for the Gospel because my life does not compare to the irresistible grace of Christ. I'll go to the unreached people groups David Platt was talking about on Wednesday. I'll go share the Gospel. I'll go to Iraq and risk my life so that the Bible can be translated. Why? Because... Everything is lost for the sake of Christ because He is so valuable. When's the last time you sat down and thought meditatively about that? I did that this past week and it changes your scope on life. You stop thinking of all these little things as bringing you fulfillment and satisfaction because you know one thing trumps them all. It's the surpassing worth of knowing Christ. It surpasses all things. In James 3, verse 13 to 17, James presents us with two types of wisdom. The wisdom from above and the wisdom from below. And by seeking Christ, because He's irresistible, we gain the wisdom from above, which says that He is the most lovely, that He is the most precious, that He is worthy. Number 10, in closing, number 10, faith that justifies longs for the consummation of of all things in Christ. By consummation, I mean all things are fulfilled once Christ comes back. Everything will be made right that was wrong. Every balance will be, every scale will be balanced. Everything will be made right. Dead faith lives for the moment without a longing for Christ's return. In the end, justification longs for Jesus to come back. When He comes back, we will all be judged according to the good and evil we have done. My question before you as we close this look at justification by faith, as we focus in with the camera, and as we see clearly what justification by faith is all about, 
I want to ask you this question. Are you ready to stand before the judgment seat of Christ? Are you ready to stand before God and give Him an account of your life? Do you think like the people in James 4, verse 13 to 15, who say, today or tomorrow we will go into such and such a town and spend a year there and trade, make a profit, yet you do not know what tomorrow will bring? What is your life for you are a mist that appears for a little while and then vanishes? Instead, you ought to say, if the Lord wills, we will live and do this or that. Do you live for the moment? without God's judgment? If you're a Christian, can you say confidently with Paul in 2 Corinthians 4, we do not lose heart. Though our outer self is wasting away, our inner self is being renewed day by day, for this light momentary affliction is preparing us for an eternal weight of glory beyond all comparison, as we look not to the things that are seen, but to the things that are unseen. For the things that are seen are transient, but the things that are unseen are eternal. He who has prepared us for this very thing is God. Who has given us His Spirit as a guarantee. So we are always of good courage. We know that while we are at home in the body, we are away from the Lord. For we walk by faith and not by sight. Yes, we are of good courage. We are of good courage and we would rather be away from the body and at home with the Lord. So whether we are at home or away, we make it our aim to please Him. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ so that we may receive what is due for what He has done in the body, whether good or evil. We will all stand at the judgment seat of Christ, and God will pass His judgment over us, will you be judged by the merits of Christ or by your own merits? Will you say, nothing in my hand I bring, simply to the cross I cling, naked come to Thee for dress, helpless look to Thee for grace, foul I to the fountain fly, wash me, Savior, or I die. Is that your confession? Will you stand before God when He passes judgment and say, look to Christ, there's nothing here. Look to Christ. If we do, if we claim Christ in the end, because we claim Him now, James 1 verse 2 says, Blessed is the man who remains steadfast under trial, for when he has stood the test, he will receive the crown of life which God has promised to those who love Him. And we will be justified before God forever. Amen.